intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peace, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who grants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one meditator between God and mankind. That man is Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed at the proper time, and for this purpose I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. So prayer is a powerful reality. Um, Wednesday, when Char called me, the biopsies were clear. I told her, Man, you made my day. Because Claudette and I have some friends who have been struggling with cancer, and we're not hearing that kind of good news for them. But to hear one person have some victory, I, again, praise God, Char, you made my day. Uh, because we all need victory. And um, as people get to know who I am in the community, invariably they ask me for prayer. It is the most common thing once they find out that I'm a pastor. I got a guy over at Panera who I've established a relationship with out of a funny kind of an opening. But anyway, almost every time I'm in there, he says, Tim, just send one up for me. It's his simple way of saying, say a prayer for me. Uh, we have regularly met as a group at uh, Village Inn, and I've had some waitresses come to me and ask me to pray for another waitress's dad who was suffering from cancer because they knew I was a pastor. They figured, well, I don't know what a pastor does, but at least there's one thing we know he does. He, he prays, we assume. Um, prayer is powerful. Um, and it's not to be diminished or to be avoided or to be ignored. I think in our modern times, we can get cynical about prayer and maybe not pray enough, or we think that something just isn't important enough to pray for. I don't know, all kinds of things can go through folks' minds. But I just want to say I really feel right now that what Paul is saying to Timothy in this text is that prayer is important. And the Bible is filled with people who prayed. The very first prayer is recorded in the book of Genesis. In Genesis 4.26 it says, at that time people began to call on the name of the Lord. Chapter 4 of Genesis is where prayer begins. And you know where it ends in the Bible? The last verse in, in the book of Revelation. So throughout the Bible, there are prayers. There are almost 50 lengthy prayers that you can find in the Bible, along with several hundred shorter prayers or mentions to prayer, let alone the book of Psalms, which is also called by others the prayer book of the church. There are folks who pray those Psalms on a regular basis. Even as they pray other scriptures, they use scripture as the foundation for their prayer. The Bible is a prayer book. It encourages us to pray. And then today, as we begin this three-week series on the pastoral epistles, this week, next week, uh, both in 1 Timothy, I believe, and then October 6th will be 2 Timothy, and Christine Quintana will be preaching that message for you. Uh, in that first Sunday in October. All these are issues dealing with Paul's writing to Timothy, who's a young pastor of the church in Ephesus. And the uh, book, 1st, uh, 2nd Timothy and Titus, are known as pastoral epistles because Paul's giving his instructions on how to deal with the intricacies uh, of leading a church, especially when it's not perfect, which, by the way, no church is perfect. So, <laughs> and one of the things going on in this church in Ephesus is a uh, false doctrine is being um, taught by some people in the church. So, 
first chapter, uh, it says this. This is what Paul says. As I urged you, Timothy, when I was going to Macedonia, remain at Ephesus so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine, nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. So let's just be clear. These myths and endless genealogies, whatever they are, they are helping people to deviate, to, be deviate, to deviate from the gospel of Jesus Christ and all that it means. And deviate, because it's deviating from the gospel of Jesus Christ, then it, the result is that there's a different lifestyle, one that does not honor God, the God who calls all people into salvation. This is the problem with false doctrine, is it, it has an effect. True doctrine should have an effect on the way we live because it shapes us and forms us. But false doctrine also shapes us and forms us. And Paul is always concerned about how you and I or the folks in Ephesus live and by, I guess, um, you know, just what we believe about the Bible, how we live. I know some people don't like to talk about doctrine, but it's important. So Paul reminds Timothy that the leads to practical, visible changes in the way people live. And that change is referred to in this letter, this, this verse that we read this morning, as peaceful, quiet, godly, and dignified. That's what true doctrine brings about to people. Peace, quiet, godliness, and dignity. That's what it's supposed to bring. That is the lifestyle we should be emulating. Now, I'm not saying that you have to be a Christian to experience that, uh, but I believe it is by its very character where how Christians should be personified. I don't believe chaos is really the kind of life we ought to be living as Christians because our God is a God of order. And if he's infusing things into our lives, we, we might have some chaotic moments, but because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and because of the power of prayer, we can still live a calm life in the midst of chaos. Many of us will pray, uh, but if well, to the individual who, that the person who is really given over to prayer, that they are trans power the gospel of Jesus Christ. One of the realities of prayer is the recognition that individuals need help. We are incapable of serving the God of the universe, the God that is revealed in Jesus Christ on our own power. We need God's aid to do it. And I have here that maybe aid is not the right idea because we think that, okay, I have my plans and I'm going forward and now I'm going to pray to God that God would come alongside me and aid me in the things I want to accomplish when in reality... We call God into our lives so that we can aid God in the things God wants to accomplish because that's what's going to get done, not our things. We come to God with our thinking and our biases and our brokenness and our crazy thoughts, and, and God transforms those into something else as we walk with God. So he starts out here, he says, I urge then, urge is a strong word, First of all, that petitions, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people. He uses four words here, and I'm going to look at the Greek. I don't normally do this. But I think it helps unpack a little bit. Uh, the first word, uh, Greek, is desis, and it's translated requests or, or petitions, depending on your translation of the Bible, and it expresses a need on the part of the one praying. Doesn't that, that makes sense, doesn't it? Why would you pray if you have no need? We pray out of need. We recognize that there is a need, so therefore we pray. Prayer begins with need, with a sense and a conviction that we can't deal with this on our own. We need God to deal with this thing called life, and it stems from an acknowledged inadequacy on our part. We know, you know what, Here, just, let's just deal with this one. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Go talk to people about Jesus Christ. Lead them into a relationship 
with God through Jesus Christ. Now, if you're a sane person, you know right now, I, I can't do that. You're right. You're going to have to talk to people about Christ, and now you need to be in prayer about it because you say, Lord, I need you to do something with this person because right now they're not able to see it. There needs to be a miracle of vision that occurs. Desis, request or petition out of need. The next one is prosuke, which is translated as prayer and is used only when a request, re request is made of God that only God can satisfy. Why else would you pray if only God can satisfy it? If I can satisfy something, I don't need to pray to God. But this kind of prayer is something that only God can satisfy. The next one is entuxis, translated petitions or intercessions. And I love this word. It meant to enter into a king's presence and submit a petition to him. In the Old Testament, the story of Esther, she's a queen, she's a Jew, she's part of the king's harem, and in that day, you did not just walk into the throne room and say, hey, king, what's happening? It didn't work that way. You needed to be invited into the king's room. It's kind of like when the queen came to the Bahamas. You couldn't just show up to that celebration. You had to have an invitation to that celebration. So this word, in Tuxedo, that we as Christians have been invited by the king to come and make a plea. That's powerful stuff. He received her presence. Esther was able to go in. The king listened to her petition, and Israel was saved. And you and I as Christians have the priceless gift of approaching the king and asking him, to intercede on behalf of others that only he can do. Lastly, Eucharista is the word that's translated as thanksgiving, and it's an important part of prayer, giving thanks. I heard some folks give thanks today. Shar gave thanks for the people who supported her. We gave thanks for Bella Hope. We gave thanks for the family that's around her. We gave thanks for folks who prayed for Shar. This is important we give thanks, and it should be part of who we are as Christians to be thankful people as we look around us and see God doing stuff that quite honestly other people might not think God had anything to do with. In some traditions, the weekly communion service is called the Eucharist because it's giving thanks. Have you ever thought of our Holy Communion as a thank you to God? Paul's given Timothy a wonderful, fully picture of prayer that, and, and Christ, that, that Christians have from God. Paul urges that prayers be made for all people. He says, for kings and for all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. So when did you last make a list of people you wanted to pray for? I just want to, maybe you've never done this. And maybe this is the first time you've ever heard of this idea. When was the last time you made a list of people you wanted to pray for? Uh, who, who were the first names that you wrote down? More than likely, you would have started with people that you know and love, your spouse or your children or your parents or close friends or close relatives, the folks who are on our mind uh, who maybe are, facing illness or death, we always pray for our friend, both uh, my friend Skip and our friend Mike, because they're just struggling with this horrible thing called cancer. But then prayers uh, usually go out in concentric circles. So that, those are the folks in that middle circle, and now there's a, an outer circle. Who would be in that? Uh, maybe we consider ourselves in the, in the middle. Well, we're in the middle, and then we kind of pray out from ourselves. But Paul says, uh, that we actually need to expand that a little more. Uh, he says we need to pray for those folks who are leaders and kings. So in their context, let's just be clear, Christianity was not a welcome religion in the first century. It was considered an aberration. Uh, Rome really didn't know what to do with it yet. 
Um, in Rome, uh, and Rome ruled uh, Israel at this point, they still had control over everything. Uh, you prayed to the emperor because he was a god. And Christians were famous for not doing that. Therefore, Rome didn't really like them. But what Paul says is, no, you don't pray to them. You pray for them. You know, you don't just pray for people you like, necessarily. You pray for everyone, and everyone is everyone. You even pray for the people who are causing problems in the church at this point in time, he says. You, call, you pray for those folks who are spreading false doctrine. Timothy, you need to pray for your enemies. And you pray specifically for those folks who, who have power to, through their leadership to kind of shape and mold the, the world in which you find yourself. You pray that they will do things so that your life can be peaceful. Because out of peace and orderliness, this is really where people become open to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I just say... It's hard to hear the gospel no matter where you are. But if your life is in total chaos, your kids are being kidnapped. Uh, I mean, just think of what goes on in some countries. The last thing you really want someone to be talking to you about is, well, do you know Jesus Christ? Do you know the Lord of the universe? And they'd be kind of saying, what does that have to do with me right now? No, we pray that leaders would create safe spaces so that the gospel could be heard. In, in the Old Testament, Jeremiah the prophet uh, is speaking to a people who are in exile. That means they're not where they should be. They are someplace else, and they're not happy about being someplace else. But this is what Jeremiah said, peace and prosperity for the city to which I have carried you into exile. This is God speaking. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Pray for Dubuque. Pray for it to prosper. Because if it prospers, you prosper. Pray for whatever city you live in. Pray for the leaders to create an atmosphere so that it would be a good place to live. Because if it's a good place to live, you'll benefit for it. And if you risk evangelism, then maybe there'll be other people who are more likely to listen to the message because they're not dealing with a lot of garbage because the leadership of the city is doing what they're supposed to do. And why wouldn't we want peace and prosperity? There, there are Christian pastors out there, that's all they preach is peace and prosperity, but there's other sides to life as well. And Paul is, says that in praying for leaders, the goal was a life where peace and quiet and godliness and holiness could grow. He goes on, he says, this is good, and it pleases God our Savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Why do we pray for everyone? Because God wants everyone to be saved. So you could say to yourself, then, well, why isn't everyone saved? I don't have an answer for you. This is what I believe. Everyone has an opportunity. This is what's going on. God says, I will create an opportunity for everyone to come to me. But I know in my heart of hearts, God says, that not everyone will take that opportunity. Why? Don't have an answer for you. But his desire is that everyone would come to him. And he says here, and this is why, for there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people, this has now been witnessed to at a proper time. He wants all people to come back home. He wants all people to be in relationship with him. And the way he created this was not a multitude of ways to come to him because that can get really confusing. He said, I, at the proper time, on Easter Sunday, back in the day, my son went to the cross and he died. He was buried and he resurrected and he ascended. At the proper time, there was a witness that this Jesus is not just some regular schmo who walked around healing and, and teaching. No, he is indeed my son, and he is the only hope for the world. If you 
want to be in relationship with God, He is the only mediator between God and mankind. He is the ransom for all people. This is not a ransom that was paid to Satan on our part. No, what it means is he took care of our sins before a holy God. And it's through his righteousness, not ours, it's through his grace, not ours, that we are called children of God because we are approaching Father God through his, their, his Son, Jesus Christ. That's the only way. And if you're approaching God any other way, I'm here to tell you this morning, that way is broken. Jesus is our only hope. And if I didn't believe that, then I should be getting off of this pulpit right now. Because I'm in a Christian church, and this is what Christians believe. So, where do we stand this morning? Who are we spending our time in prayer for? Do we only pray for the leaders that we voted for, or, or are we vote, uh, praying for the folks who are on the other side of the aisle? Have you come to a place where this is your only hope? Is that a reality for you, that you know that you can go to him because he's the king, and because of this relationship we have through him, you know you can pray to God? And if you haven't reached that place, why not? What's holding you back from putting it all in the hands of Jesus? Is he your only hope? Have you shared that truth with anyone lately? Have you done any kind of evangelism? Have you talked about how God has saved you or uh, comforted you or given you courage through Jesus Christ? Have you shared that with anyone? Not braggadociously, I don't even know if that's a word, but humbly, but humbly. Because you know when you did it, it was like kind of a little miracle that you didn't react out of uh, this high emotion kind of it. You just, wow, that was, that was kind of godly, godly, godlike, I don't know. Have you shared that with anybody? Not to brag, just say, you know, God is alive and well and he's working in my life. God wants all people to come back home to him. And he has made us heralds in the process. We are to speak. Paul says he's a herald of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He wants us to be the same. Are we praying? Are we praying for everyone? Are we believing that Jesus is our only hope? Where are we? That's the questions for you to look at this week. Let's pray. Lord, you've asked us to pray for everyone. Help us to realize that there are no boundaries in prayer. Uh, that we pray for all people because you desire that all people come to you. So we can pray that our leaders give us contexts of peace and quiet and tranquility, but we also pray that they too would come to know you. Uh, we pray for folks in our cubicles at work. We pray that, that maybe they would work so that our company can do well and that we can live in peace and prosper. But we also pray, Lord, we would like them to come to know you. We pray for our students, uh, the good students and the discipline issue students that are in our schools. And we pray that, Lord, that they would be engaged in learning and so that the schools can be great places to learn but we also pray that they would come to know you. We pray for our police department, Lord, that the, the folks who are in the police department would be folks who follow the law, who have compassion for all people, so that we can live without any kind of craziness in our city, and yet we also pray, Lord, that, that they would come to know you. Lord, you've asked us to pray for everyone. Help us to expand our prayer boundaries for everyone. And we expand our prayer boundaries, Lord, because we believe you want everyone to know you. So we pray for them. We pray for ourselves that we would be good heralds of your message. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. And we all say amen.